you're listening to the Money Monopolizers Podcast, helping you take control of your financial destiny. It's about time that we invest more in our financial literacy and work towards building generational wealth. If you think you're ready to do the same, then you've come to the right place. Alex, Marlon, y'all ready? Let's get this bread. What's good, everybody? It's Alex Camuno here, and we are episode 20 of the Money Monopolizers podcast. I'm here with my co walls. Marlon, how you doing today, bro? Man, I'm doing good as always. I'm excited for this episode because we got to find another guest speaker coming up, Jimmy McIver. And I'm hoping that y'all enjoy her, her story as much as we did because she has a lot of gems and she's going to be dropping this episode. I think it's going to just be really good for everybody here. How about you, bro? Definitely. Yeah, we got a great episode. Um, y'all definitely got to, you know, stay through this one. She's dropping super, super uh, great jewelry, free jewelry in this <laughs> one. So y'all definitely got to. Uh, listening um especially when she starts you know just telling her story because you know i think a lot of there's a lot of ways to kind of get into this game and learn you know the stuff that we do and all this you know stuff about investing in business but you know i think there's like you could take one or two you could take the the normal route or, or the i wouldn't even say normal i would say the conventional route where you um you know you you self-educate yourself or you go take a course or whatever you re- listen to podcasts you do whatever or you could just, you know, go ahead and hit up the school of hard knocks, right? And that's definitely kind of how she got her, uh, uh, you know, started this business <laughs> straight from the school of hard knocks. But yeah, let's uh, without further ado, we ain't gotta waste no more time. Hey, Jamisa, welcome to the show. How you doing today? I'm fine. Thanks for having me, guys. For sure, for sure. We appreciate you coming on here. Um, yeah, we hope to have a great conversation with you and. You know, you know, I'm sure you're gonna drop some gems for us. So uh, we're definitely looking forward to that. But yeah, let's get let's hop right into it. So um, yeah, we kind of just introduced you, but I want you to kind of tell us about yourself and the beginning of your story from like just laid out in like pretty much chronological order from the beginning to the end, and kind of give us your background growing up and how you started, and also where you at now in oh, terms of your whole business. <laughs> a lot. So obviously, I'm 26 now. I started at 19. 18, 19 ish. Um, before I started to do real estate, because I started by accident. I say that all the time. It really is how I started. It was by accident. It wasn't intentional at all. Um, prior to that, I was a cashier, shop right. Um, when I was 19, um, my grandma, which is my father's mom, she had a conversation with me about her house. You know, she had lived in this house for my entire existence. It's my grandma's house. You know, you got the grandma's house. And she said, hey, if something was to happen to me, what would happen to the house? And I was like, I don't know. Like, we got to Google. I'm not sure. Like, what are you talking about, right? Um, and she just said, listen, well, you're the most responsible one. I want you to oversee it for me. Um, she requested that I be the landlord. People want, was supposed to pay me rent. Uh, it was supposed to be the family house. What did she say? She didn't, want it to, she didn't want me to sell it. This was pretty much all we had, and she wanted to keep it in the family. I was like, all right, cool. No problem. I got you. So we signed the papers that day. Or was it? No, it wasn't that day, actually. It was a few days after that, because I was just like, you know. It was not a sense of urgency on my end, because it was like, what are you talking about? Still, pretty ignorant to all of it. When we finally sold the papers, it still meant nothing to me, because she lived there. So I remember signing the papers, and I went on about my life, and she went on about hers. And she died, like, a year after that. And then it was like, dun, dun, dun. like, okay, this is what that meant. You actually really have a house now. Mm. But at that time, the moment she died, literally, like, the same day, um, it was my dad. He went in, and he was, like, changing the locks. And then my uncle, which is his brother, was arguing with him about that. Like, no, you can't change it. This is my mom's house. Like, that was a thing. And then you have my great-grandma, who's still alive. Uh, She actually raised me. And we were really close, and she pulled me to the side, like, that's actually your house, and you have to tell them something right now before they kill each other, because they didn't like, ah. But I was just, like, still sad that my grandma died. Like, can we cry and stuff? Like, can we plan a funeral and stuff like that, right? Um, so it became a thing. I finally told them, oh, I have broke loose. Money makes people crazy in real life. So I was like, uh-oh. They didn't take it too well. But it, it was what it was. It was my house, and they couldn't come changing locks. Like, I put my foot down, kind of. I got a little feet, so it wasn't, like, a big stand that I <laughs> told them. Like, listen, this is what it is. This is the paper. This is my house. Beat it, Right? Because you also have to keep in mind that the house, 
was like most grandmoms live. But I don't want to make it cliche, but standards. Grandmoms, they don't live modern. They don't update stuff. She didn't have recess lighting. She dropped stone. It was a grandmom's house. So it did need a lot of work. It was deferred maintenance. Because my grandma was the type that could fix anything. Like, you know how they say it's the house that Jack built? Well, just imagine Jack being my grandma because, you know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. what was going on in there. Um, <laughs> but my first bright idea was, oh, we could live here. My partner at the time, he's my husband now, but he was my boyfriend. I was like, oh, we're paying rent over here and this house is free and clear. Let's just go live free. This is going to be great. And that's when I had my first brush with reality um, after she passed because we had people come in to give us quotes for the house. And those numbers was like, huh? So, hey, you're saying that they need $60,000 worth of work, but she just lived here, like, yesterday. So you're saying, like, right now, you gotta, that's a lot of money. Then it was like, yeah, you're going to have to do this. The foundation is all, you got to break the walls down. Look, it was a leak right here. It's water in the walls. Like, they're just saying things to me that I'm not used to hearing. So I was like, all right, well, like, what are we going to do? But one thing that I remember being constant because at first we were going to try to just break the construction down in pieces. Very overzealous of me, if I do say for myself. <laughs> um, but what I realized at that time is that a lot of people were interested in it. Every demo person that we called in, every, a trash hauler, it was a guy who we called to clean the trash out of it. He was like, yeah, I'll buy it right now. Like, walk into the truck, I'll write you a check right now. Like, they were on it. And I was like, it ain't that bad. Something's wrong. They're like, something's going on here. But at the time, still, I didn't have the knowledge of real estate. And I didn't really pay it any mind. Um, needless to say, the whole idea of fixing it up was overwhelming. It was like the numbers were crazy. I, was like, no, I don't even care about it that much. I like where I live anyway. So I feel it's not ideal for me. I grew up there, so I don't need to come back. Um, but during that time, I was pregnant with my second child. So that pregnancy was really hard. I had to go to the hospital and like, I was on bed rest for like a month and a half. It was crazy. And during that time of not being able to watch the house, my family saw that as an opportunity to break in. Every day almost. Oh, wow. Oh, they both look like wow. it. Who <laughs> does that? Then you have my boyfriend, and he's, like, at the hospital with me. I'm like, no, go check on the house. So, like, every day you drive in, like, 45, 50 minutes, and every day he's finding something. Else. Um, They were, like, trashing the house, I guess, looking for something. Like, I don't know. But they were doing all of that every single day. I'm like, yo, you can't do that. Um, But we had a neighbor, which is so funny. When I think about it, like, now knowing everything that I know. This guy, super clean, like, just super clean. You remember, what is it, the Proud family? And you had, like, Wizard Kelly? He, yeah. <laughs> just fresh, that was him. Except he wasn't African-American. And you could see his head. Brief, you could see his head, for sure. <laughs> yeah. points, cool guy, briefcase, like, real dapper. He was my grandma's neighbor, oddly enough. Um, but anyway, we became friends. So one day, he's like, look, I don't know how you're dealing with this. They're stressing me out because his house is $300,000, right? That's the one next door to my grandma that was once abandoned and then once completely demolished. Like, there was, next year. There was no house there at a point in time not too long ago. Right now, it's fully built from the ground up, and he paid a pretty penny to be there. So he was like, I can't. I ain't paid this much money to deal with this, right? So what are we going to do? I was like, look, I don't know what to do. I don't even want it. It's just I'm in my, over my head. So he had connected me with his realtor. Really great guy. That was the guy who had helped him purchase his house. And he was mm-hmm. like, yeah, well, we can list it. Do you want to get rid of it or do you want to keep it? I was like, well, I don't want to keep it. I was trying to explain to him what I was going through up until that point. So he was like, all right, look, it's no problem. You sign here, you sign here. We'll list it for $125, um, and we'll just put it on the market. So then $125, like $125,000, he's like, yeah. <laughs> but it was weird because everybody who were making me those cash offers, they're like, yeah, it's not worth any more than eighty. Like, you ain't going to get <laughs> 70 in cash, like, this is what they're telling me. So when I hear him say 125 as a professional, I'm like, all right, let's trust you. You're the guy with the contract. So the other guy was trying to cut his checks out the truck. We had um, signed the paperwork on it, put it on the market. I think it stayed on the market maybe six to seven days. And then I get a call home. He's like, yo, we're at a bidding war. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means. Like, a lot of people want it. Um, we asked for 125. We're currently at 152. What do you want to do? Wow. Oh, that's a long way from 70. <laughs> what are we going to do? So, uh, like I said, it was only like seven days. Then I'm thinking about it. I probably could have held out a little bit longer. But we cashed in on a 152. Um, that was it. And at that time, I was 20. Almost 21. <sighs> wow. <laughs> that is a 
crazy, crazy story. Okay, so I want to I want to kind of break that down a little bit too. That's why I stopped because it gets crazier. But I was like, <laughs> yeah. sex this first. Yeah, give us that little sex so we could break that down first, and then sure. we'll continue. But um, I mean, just starting from like the beginning of that. So you said, okay, so your grandma, uh, before she even passed away, mm-hmm. she y'all had like did a D transfer. Um, is it? I, I assume just because she knew she was like you know getting sick or something was happening, and she so she said. Sick. I don't want to say she was already sick. She was all like she was overweight. She was never like the healthiest person. Yeah. Now I do think that she knew that her condition was worsening. Even her introducing that's not conversations we have. Like we don't talk about finances in my family or credit or how was it. That's not a normal thing for her. So for her to have brought that up, she must have knew like, hey, look, <laughs> I'm not feeling the best. Yeah. So, and another thing you mentioned too, you said, cause she had mentioned that she told you, look, this is, uh, I want you to be the one that has this house, right? I want you to, cause I know you're the responsible one. I want you to be the one that manages this. You collect the rent, you make sure people pay you. You are the one that's going to run it the way it should be ran. Right. So did she like, was there anything else that she said when she was like, okay, did I, I guess like, did she leave you any sort of instructions or anything with it? Or was it just like, I don't think she had instructions really. Like, you do a lot of winging it when you don't know stuff. I don't yeah. think, even when it came down to us doing the dollar D transfer, I had to figure out how to do that. Like, I had yeah. to Google it. I had to find a title company. This was my first time with all of this. She didn't know. It's not like she was like, this is what we're going to do. I had to actually do certain research and say, Grandma, this seems to be the best option. Mm-hmm. Like, there was no manual that came along with the project. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. So then, Marlon, I'm going to ask this question and I'm going to let you go. Okay. But um, because, you know, I want to point that out, too, because that's really a big stigma, especially within the, like the black community, too, with, you know, what she said. She said, this is all we have. Right. Yeah. This is like at that time, like at that moment, she had a house. My great grandma had two houses, which were right around the corner. We're right in South Philly. So this is a what they call what do they call them, like Point Breeze area. So you have houses selling 300 between 300 to five, six hundred thousand dollars, depending on the square footage. But we had three of those debt free in our family at the time. Easily, we were sitting on a million dollars worth of property at yeah. that time before she died. She didn't know that. I didn't right. know that either. As a matter of fact, because um, my great grandmom lived in one house and then she had one directly up the street, the next hundred that my grandfather had left her. So I guess they were neighbors and like fell in love and she moved up the street and was like, I'm going to keep my house just in case you break up. They never, <laughs> up. but she had two houses literally up the street. But when I sold my one, she was like, okay, well, I'm going to sell mine too. Because it was sitting there abandoned. And that's like one of my biggest regrets. Because what I could have did was take the cash I had and then invest it into rehabbing that her, that other property instead we sold it. But we literally gave away almost a million dollars with those two properties when we didn't have to. Ooh, that, and that's the importance of why, that's why we always preach financial education is the answer is not money. Money is not the answer. It's no. financial education because you sitting on a million, a lot, and a lot of people are in that same situation right, right now. now. They sitting on on hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity, and they had a potential to change their life, but they have, they don't know any, no. they have no idea why, how powerful it is. Yeah, that's all. That's all. Wow, and I think one thing, just growing up in, in like my household and just hearing your story, is that a lot of your family members probably weren't weren't very well versed with like finances and how to handle their own money, and um, I'm starting to wonder. I know your grandma came to you as like a 19 year old, right? As far as talking to you about, hey, I want you to take over this house. But you probably had no other communication with anybody, whether it's grandma or parents, about finances or how to handle your own money or how to do anything like buying a house or how to own a house, how to sell a house or anything like that. Why do you think those subjects are so so taboo in in households and like schools and stuff? Because that's something that's not really taught to you as you're growing up. But then all of a sudden, once you get, you just get thrown into it, like kind of how you did. Something that's necessary. So I feel like it's two different reasons because you ask two different questions. One is why is it not taught in school? I feel like school is an institutionalized thing. Like that is its own separate system and it's designed in its own separate way. I think everything that we do in America anyway is like cliche. It's designed to have rich people become richer or successful people become more successful. And then it's like a a will, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So school to me, because I did go to college. Maybe that's she thought I was the most responsible because I did make a lot of good decisions throughout my life. Like I did go to college. I dropped out, uh, which I feel like was a really good decision. I wanted to be a psychologist, actually, but I wanted to be a clinical child psychologist, psychologist, not a psychiatrist, which would have required me to get my doctorate. Well, as a freshman, 
I didn't drop out until like almost the end of a sophomore year. But as a freshman, I'm seeing myself like doing these genetics, not really focusing, not making most of my time or the money that I, you know, borrowed to be there. I'm looking at wasted Wednesdays, thirsty Thursdays, faded Fridays, melted. Fridays. I'm like, yo, how many days do you guys have to drink here? Like, <laughs> but I'm like, y'all finding yourself. Like, cause at that time I always knew I like to help people. That was my thing since I was like a small fry. That was my thing. But I'm like, I don't think that I'm really ready to be here right now. So when I left school, it was with the intention to come back later. But once you get thrown into the real and just realize some of the things you're up against, you're like, I don't know. It's learning from a professor that's not quite doing what I'm aiming to do is, is good for me. Like in the real world, you can find a mentor who's doing what you want to do. In college, it's like a slim chance that your business professor has a business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like your accountant major has his finances in order. Like, can I see your tax return, sir? Well, then I don't want you to be teaching me CPA work. And there's no disrespect, but that's really how it is. And you just think about it. You have a time to eat, a time to go to sleep. You have an RA, but that's the system that they design. And then when you take a step back and you're looking at those who are wealthy, some of them do have um, higher education as, you know, something to fall back on. Mm-hmm. But what they're doing that made them rich is not what they got to major in. To me, if you're paying attention to people who are billionaires, millionaires, some of them didn't finish school. A lot of them like, I dropped out. When you have a certain type of brain and you think a certain type of way, you're not fit to be in school you, it's like not all, and I could be wrong, but I'm just saying for the people that I know who are successful, like firsthand, they brain don't work. Like I'm gonna sit here and learn. I'm gonna take notes. Yeah, cram it up. A lecture class, like that's not how their brain works. It's a hands-on, let me learn in the field type of thing. College doesn't really provide much of it, depending on your major, obviously. Um, but I think in school, they like if you really want to be successful, you want to figure it out. And sometimes you figure it out by not being in school. And sometimes you figure it out why you in school. Eighty thousand dollars worth of debt later, like it, it just, yep. you, know, you know, who you are and what your major is again. Because some things come in handy after. I just think with school they have a system um, that's designed to keep the economy a certain way. Literally, that's what it's about to me. Yeah. Now, in households, depending on the household, uh, it's the same thing. They can't teach you what they don't learn. Mm-hmm. So, just going back to like slave mentalities, and it's weird. I try to not use certain references, but when you think and learn. It's like as a slave, you were you were told to like stay in line, right? As a slave, the the power, not only intellectually but like physically, the power that you possess is crazy because the stuff they like we build houses, we raise children, we cook, we fed they the the moms breastfed the children like the stuff that we were capable of doing was already amazing and they saw the value in that. But their job to keep us in order was for them to keep the value from us. Like we weren't supposed to see that. That's what happened now. It's conditioning. So it was like, oh, I could be great, but not so great, right? So they learned to do bare minimum. This bare minimum stuff. So with my grandma, even my great grandma, like it was up to us to retire her. Now, she retired three times from like regular jobs and kept getting more jobs. I'm like, why? Because social security and pension doesn't cut it. But it's because they were through look, as long as you got a job and you got an education, you're okay. But the question has never arose of like education from who? Education on what? Like they was like, uh-uh. We got to stay in our lane. So they had this lane that was created by people and they followed it because that was okay. Owning one house is good. But it's like, why well, own one? You own 500,000. Like my grandma, the house that she had given to me, she got that for a dollar. Now, had she had a hundred dollars and got a hundred houses, I would be a billionaire. Right now. Hmm. Same concept, same rule. Even if I had trial and error, slip and fall, figure it out. Had she got a hundred of those one dollar, but to her, a one dollar house is cool. I got house. Like she was with it. I'm not with it. <laughs> the sky is like I won't say the sky is the limit. I say that's the limit you create for yourself because they said you can't go past that. Why? Who said you can't? I want to see. That's that's my whole attitude. It's a different that's- mindset. I love love it already. It's dropping gems for real. Definitely. And I think that's that's super important, too, because you got to you got to change the narrative from the root. Right. You got to start mm-hmm. implementing those seeds and planting those seeds early, because, you know, the, the the thing about society is a lot of people, they'll like you're raised a certain way and yep. you are so accustomed to doing something for so long. If you oh. wait too long, it's in, it's too it's almost impossible to revert your mindset into to thinking like I mean, it's possible. But like for most people, they never, ever, you know, once you're you know, 30 years old, you're stuck in your ways almost, right? Yeah. You never really <laughs> are able to revert out of that. And you may, yeah, you can achieve financial freedom and that whole thing. But if you, if those things are planted a lot earlier, then man, your life is just going to be <laughs> completely different. And that's what makes the difference. 
Like, I'm not going to say all oh, slaves stayed in their land. You have rebellious ones. Harriet Tubman was like, I'm out. But yeah. she still said, I could have freed way more people had they known that they were slaves. That's the thing. And I would just accredit a lot of my success to rebellion first. Like, common sense, obviously, I'm really intelligent. I won't take that away from myself. But rebellion first, just that you're not going to tell me what it is. I'm going to figure that out. Like, I'm not just, I'm not going to take your word for it. Because you have to, it's your life. And it's, it's too short to take for granted, I'll be honest. When you think about the odds, because everything's a gamble, you think about the odds, it's like you're going to live and die. That is a given. That is it. You don't know when you're going to die. So worst case scenario is if you try something and it doesn't work. But then the other side of that coin is if you try something and you rock it, it's like, well, damn, you know, you want to just really spend the time you have here being normal. It's like, no. Taking a chance, definitely. Okay, so you mentioned that you dropped out of college. Um, I guess you in like the first couple of years. Now you you also mentioned that um the, the mentors that you had in uh, college weren't necessarily going to be the ones that were like going to prepare your business. So yeah. did you have any mentors or in, any way that you were learning once you dropped out that helped you prepare your real estate business? So after I sold the house, the realtor was like, "That's a lot of money." I was like, "Yeah, I know, right?" I was just feeling real crazy about it. I remember I didn't even take the check to the bank for like a week. I was scared. I had you gotta understand. I have never, ever, ever seen that much. I was just nervous. I'm, I took a picture of it. I still have a picture on my phone. Actually. I took a picture of it. I was like, oh, this is crazy. This is when I rubbed it. I was looking at what the hell? <laughs> Walking the bank and they don't think I did something crazy. I was like, what the hell do I do with this? Um, but I did know that I wanted to buy houses. And in the back of my mind, if one house had gotten me that much money, then I needed more. So the realtor didn't let up. So. He um, connected me with this investor. And that was my first time differentiating real estate investor from real estate agent, right? Because I was just thinking it was like the same thing. So I met this investor guy and uh, he was like, yeah. So what's going on? What do you want to do? I was like, yeah, I just want to buy houses. He's like, well, yeah. How much you got to work with? I'm like, yeah, I got 150. We just talking. He's like, all right. So when you do the funding, how you pick a house? I was like, what's funding? He was like, well, that's the people who give you money. I said, no, no, no. I have one, right? I got my like, what? So then we get into the whole thing. Yeah, I had a house and I sold it. He's like, you, you sold a house where? For what? I was like, yeah. Was, that's how Philly he was like, He gave you my number today. He didn't give it to you two weeks ago. I said, no. He's like, you could have sold your house for 300000 I was like, huh? He's like, yeah, you, or you could have kept it and you could have pulled the equity out. You ain't even had to. Because we look alike. So we, we're the same type of people. Like, but can I go get it back? And can we do that? But you just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's too late and at this point that same realtor I, he had sold my grandma's stuff like once he helped me I let him help her that became a thing he was like don't talk to him anymore he's a good guy but just unless you want to list the house I think you should just do the investor thing like this works over here so the guy will walk me through it so that was my very first real estate like my very first one um, he was hurt for me he yeah. was like you sold it yeah you should have uh, but he helped me out a lot because the first thing I wanted to do was create a portfolio. Well, I'm not going back to work. So now I have to replace that income. Well, fresh out the gate, he sold me a property that he had that had a tenant in there. And that automatically replaced what I was making with my regular job. So I was like, cool. So I to go back to work. We got that. And then he sold me three more. I think I, I think all in total, I may have purchased two or three houses. One was income producing, one was a shell. He had sold that to me for 6500 He wanted to sell it for twelve, but... I guess at this point he felt like I've been robbed enough. He's like, just take it for sixty five because he had purchased it for twenty five hundred, so he didn't really lose. He made something out of it. Um, but the relationship that was formed behind it was like priceless. I still got the house. It's pretty cool. That was my first mentor. Okay, so you get the six figures. You go buy three houses, right? And mm -hmm. so you're financing these just straight up cash. Right? Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. I mean, you do what you know at that point. It's so. Cool. <laughs> so okay so then what came next after that was it like okay i want to just keep doing this i want to keep doing this were you looking at the money it was like okay i'm running out of money was there a point where you were like okay i need to go educate myself more or was it just keep my first year I my first year i purchased nine houses i didn't start running out of money until that so i got to like nine i'm like nine uh -huh. so i was good it's like i'm running out of money but i do have a passive income coming yeah. now some of the properties i had picked up weren't rehabbed and renovated like i did get some turn fees but it was a few in it i was like like the house I had got from him, I didn't even see it. I just bought it for 65. That's called the tree house. So if you ever heard my interviews and I'm like, it's the tree house. Yeah. Um, and though I wasn't prepared for that. Like he was like, just do it for real. You got it. You can do it. Just fix it up and refine. I was like, Bleh. 
You don't fix this up. I don't even want to walk in here. This is scary looking. The house is so scary. So scary. Um, he, he, he did me a favor with that because that's 6,500. Full rehab, removing tree and all, didn't surpass 60. No matter how many contractors I got in there, the rehab didn't surpass 60. Everybody gave me that quote. The house up the street, which was smaller in size, sold for 120. So I was like, ah, even at my 60 with my 65 in, I still have a nice amount of equity. Like it still was a good purchase. Eyesight, it was really hard to look at. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, they saw me coming with the cashier shut. I remember my first wholesale experience. I ended up finding out it was a wholesale deal when I was at the closing table. I was so proud of myself. I had met this guy on Instagram. He was selling the house because I hit YouTube University and I just tried. They were like, follow investors. I was on Instagram like, Inve everybody had investments in any of my college. I was like, yeah, yeah, you got you one of us, yeah. So um, I met the guy, went to see the property. It needed nothing besides paint and baseboard heaters. Literally needed nothing. So I remember negotiating him down like 10,000, getting to the closing table, feeling accomplished. This is my first like negotiating. I did good. And um, it's a guy there, and he signed all the papers, me and him. I'm like, well, who's this guy? He's like, oh, that's the owner. I'm like, well, who are you? And I didn't even know I signed an assignment contract versus an agreement. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Like, closing enough, and they just always right there, like, hi. And I'm like, all right, so, huh? Then I'm like, oh, that was the extra 15. So they took me back to the HUD, and I had a class right there on the spot at the closing table. I'm like, so this was a HUD. So you see this fee, and this is this, and this is what you did. And you move this up, you move this down, da da da. And I was like, oh, okay. Fifteen hundred dollar class. Yeah. Fifteen thousand. His assignment fee was fifteen thousand. Oh, you said fifteen thousand. I thought you said fifteen hundred. Definitely fifteen thousand. Sheesh. Oh, that was a semester. <laughs> 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 I'm in a semester. Oh, um, and they saw me coming. Yeah, call the girl. I got buyer. Now I'm on people's buyers list. I got buyer. Yeah, get cash buyer. I'm like, hello. And people call me ring. Like, are you still buying? I'm like, huh? No. Like, it was. It was crazy, but it, the, the funny thing was, so I told you I had uh, got my great grandma to sell hers. And she sold hers because it was dilapidated. And it used to get notices all the time from a place called the sheriff's office. All the time. Yeah, how do you go up the sheriff's office? How do you go up the sheriff's office? So we would always figure out one way or another to get it off the list. Um, and I was like, what's that place? Because they take houses and I buy those. I should go with them. Because they invited me, first of all. They said it was taking your house. So clearly, that was our personal invitation. So I went there. With my mentor's girlfriend, she had a strategy too. It was real cute. Like, she'd write all these houses down, and she just come up with this thing, and it was great. And I went in there ready for war, and I was with her. And she was like, "Okay, you don't bid past this and this, and you got it." She just gave me this whole thing, and I did the exact opposite. She was so scared for me that first time in there. I did the complete. I was crazy. You laugh at. I'm telling you, my rebelliousness is crazy. But it worked. that that day, that first day, I had purchased a seventeen hundred dollar property. I was like, boom. She was like, oh, she looking at me. I'm looking at her like, yeah, that list was cute, but you got it, y'all. But that's how I dropped out. I don't wanna, I'm in here now. I get the silver thing. So I, mean, I did. But it was just crazy because I went in with a substantial amount to spend just that day on that auction. And I spent $1,700. And it was crazy because I, I won the house for $1,700, but I spent $600. Because when you win a bid at a certain auction, you don't buy the house. You put down a percentage, which is either $600 or 10%. And I'm thinking, I had six hundred dollars working at shop. Yeah. Because then you have thirty days to either come up with the rest, but then you could sell it like a wholesale deal. I'm like, so you, you turn six hundred dollars in a thousand? I could have been quit my job. So that that was a game changer. Like that day changed my entire everything. Where are you right now? What does your portfolio look like right now at this point? And then let's kind of talk about that. Right. Uh, well, because I really am curious about how because you got nine properties in your first year. I'm not sure where you just. You're buying them all at auction, or they rentals, or were you nah, flipping any? They was they were all at auction, and a few oh. of them get flipped. So, so they were all flipped. I didn't buy them at auction. Some of them were directly from people. Um, I think I only got three from auction at that time. Some of them needed to be renovated. So just look at it like you have this money, but you're spending it actively. You're spending it on acquiring properties, trying to fix up properties. You're doing a lot with this money. Now, one fifty is not a lot of money, right? And to somebody who doesn't have it, they're like, yes. When you realize the buying power of 150, you like, or 152, excuse me. I think I spent the two on the cruise, though, so just discount that. <laughs> yeah. um, realize it, it's going to carry, but not so far if you're not doing it right. And at this time, I had not tapped into leveraging. I had not tapped into private money. I hadn't tapped into anything, like crowdfunding, none, none of that stuff. This was all foreign terminology. So that first year was good. I just grabbed it. Then I used the next two years. 
to just like figure it out. So that's when I started to really figure it out. Like, okay, so you need more money. So you got to sell that one. That's the weakest one. Sell it. So you get some more cash. Right. So I did that like two or three times. I actually was a private lender. So I would give out money for people to do deals, which is very risky. I just yeah. used to be in deals. So it was cool. So like, okay. It worked. I got my returns. So that, that had kept me cool a lot. I did that like two or three times with some real good deals, like some really good ones. So that was kind of how I kept, along with the rentals, that's kind of how I kept everything at day. Um, and then I began Rosebud Investments. And that's a six figure company in itself. So right now my portfolio is 19, is it 20? Like 19 properties. Um, in total, it's three point something million. Don't know. I will count it because I have to be accurate when I say these things. But I ain't gonna give myself the point. There's no the point floating around. Just say three million. Um, debt free. Still. Debt still, free. Still debt free. Not wow. One, not one more year yet. Cause now I'm at the phase in my career where I want to leverage. Now I yeah. want to leverage. Not that mm-hmm. I. So, what made you? So why why were you? Was it just because you didn't know about leverage before, or what was your? Because my whole thing, I'm all, I'm big on OPM, so I'm just always. OPM makes perfect sense because you, I spent enough of mine to know that well, I could use yours. I'm with it, but at that time, I didn't have credit. You gotta remember who you were talking to. Yeah. Credit. I didn't have anything. I didn't have a credit card. I had student loans, but they were like, well, you paid me. So what are we gonna do? Is it? So you gotta close the account. My credit score was almost non-existent. You don't have tax returns. At this point in the game, you better ain't having difficulties. I might have had one, but the one that I did have, it showed that I made eight thousand dollars that year. Remember, I was a cashier. Yeah. So when you're leveraging, there are certain aspects that you have to take into consideration when leveraging. And you do have private money, which they don't even look at your tax return; they're looking at your assets. And then it's like twenty or thirty percent down. But this is a brand new world to me. I'm like thirty percent. Then they're saying like scopes or works and draws. I'm like, what? But I'm buying properties left and right for like a half of what you're telling me to put down as a, uh, I don't even know a contract. I'm just going to keep buying. That was just my mindset around it because I couldn't really grasp the whole concept of borrowing. I couldn't do traditional lending. That was it. You need two years tax returns and at least a 580 credit score. So, you yeah, know, I was, it was kind of trial and error. So the first few years, I just rocked out. There is so much to unpack between everything that you've said. But um, I think one of your biggest advantages is that you are somebody that's willing to like assess a situation and be like, no, this isn't for me or no, I'm, I'd rather just learn from experience and learn from what somebody was telling me. Like you like, you almost have like a BS rater. Like, nope, I, I, don't, I don't like how that sound. I, I'm not I'm nothing for it. It's a vir- <laughs> that's the Virgo trait. Like we're analytical, but we mm-hmm. really if it's not, like, I met a lot of Virgos. But it's oh, like, Virgo this is, like, this is what it, if it's good or if it's bad, this is what it is. And that really helps you to adapt the type of mindset that I have. I'm, I'm not really a negative person at all. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's like a how can I? And then, and then if I fail, like I said somewhere that I don't acknowledge failure because I don't. Anything that ever went wrong for me ended up going right. That's how I look at it. It's like, okay, this didn't go right, but I learned how to go about something the right way. Like, I just don't get too beat up off of stuff. Like, I don't get... I'm a very emotional being too, so I have to be that way. Otherwise, I'd be crying every day with everything. Literally, like that's a very good thing too. Very emotional. Um, no doubt. Yeah, and <laughs> one thing I want to kind of touch on too, because I know a lot of just like looking at like your story from the beginning to the end, right? You got a three. You built a three million dollar portfolio in what's about six years. So at oh, that point, that's the next, cause I want to say I was an active investor. I want to say maybe three or four. So you could say the six in total, but like active investment was like three or four years. Okay. So you built, let's say, you know, three years. In three years, you built a $3 million portfolio. So I know a lot of people, and I'm sure you've gotten this a lot, or even if you haven't gotten it a lot, like straight up, I'm sure I know a lot of people think, because I know how people are. But a lot of people, they're going to be thinking, oh, well, she, I mean, yeah, she yeah. can do that. She got $150,000. Uh, you know, she came up on six okay. figures. Of course and she I could do that. I mean, because I'm venomous when I speak sometimes, but they feel like I could tell that they, I could look at them and tell, like, that's easy. Anybody could do it. I call bullshit on it, though. So what do you what do you say to those like what to those people that think that like you because you they're saying you got an unfair advantage. So what do you say to those people that say, oh, you, you got an unfair advantage. That's not fair. Anyone if any if I had that, I could do that, too, because I know people are going to say that. So what do you say to that? How many people inherit money? and lose? Period. Mm-hmm. Many people won the lottery, bought jets and whatever they did. And like now they broke. Like I know people who have had money and don't have. I know a personal person very close to me. Went to a casino and won sixty thousand dollars. Doesn't have a house. Doesn't have a car. Like at all. You didn't buy a squatter. 
Like you, you got a car note right now with sixty thousand. You get what I'm saying? I know people who has they had more than I had, and they don't have anything to show. I know people like that, so of course it's easy to feel like that because everybody. That's like a victim mentality. They're like I can't because yeah. I didn't have that star. So that's how I look at it. I don't even take it personal because oh well, call it what you want. I'm here right now. Whatever it took for me to get, that's where I'm at. But if you look, I don't remember the exact statistics, but it's like a great amount of people who have had inheritances and blew it. Matter of fact, if you look at rich people, millionaires, look at how many of them are not leaving their inheritance to their children. I know rich people who leave their like heir to pets. Okay? They give it to their cat. I know they have nieces and nephews, even if they don't have children. You want to give you a million dollars to a cat? Those people with your finances though. I'm serious, even down to my family. She picked me. She knew. I don't know where she knew, but she knew something. Nobody in my family could have did it. I'm gonna be like, and I love them. They're my family. You know, it is what it is. But they, they actually all wanted to split the money. I forgot about that. So my dad wanted forty thousand or something. I don't know. My uncle wanted forty thousand. Y'all do the math, cause now I'm at eighty. Okay, I'm at eighty loss if I was giving away money. I had to be mentally strong enough to say no. It's a, it's a mindset thing. Like nobody could have did it. Like I, I don't think nobody in my family could have did it. Like my grandma, it was her house. She said, "This all we got." She couldn't even do it. My mom, if you don't know something, so you just think about the grandma that gave me that house that just changed the dynamics of my whole life and generation to follow. That was the same home she had forever. It's not like I sold it eighty years after she died, so that appreciation mm -hmm. wasn't that much. It was like a year later. The same house that changed my life could have changed hers while she was alive. My mom says, I know this is all we had. I just be wanting to ask her right now, like, look what we got now. Like, this is different. But nah. Yeah, they could feel like, I mean, I'll give you 150. Let me see what you do with it. But. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's huge in society, too. People love to blame other, um, you know, scenarios besides, yeah. like, analyzing themselves and most people just think oh no it's nothing that i could be doing it's just the situation i'm in right there's mm -hmm. I, there's not anything i could be doing differently to be changing my destiny right there's yeah. and that's just a very that's a poor mindset literally very you're gonna stay broke mindset. forever forever i was a millionaire when i was at shop right <laughs> man no money my brain i would come home and i would like tell my boyfriend like all right, nobody found me today. Like, I will go to work in hopes that somebody amazing will come into my life. Because my personality, I'm like, I'm, I'm like really awesome, right? I was in a world seeking opportunity. I was attracting the things I wanted. I wasn't going to be, if I didn't, you know, do the whole property thing with my grandma, I still feel like I would have been fine. Yeah, you're creating your own look in every situation. Yeah, I was expecting that in the world. Like, I would go out in the world, like, okay, where's the great people? I'm great. I'm too great. I'm, I always know I was bigger than my circumstances. If you don't have that in you, it's not something that money can help you with. I guess not something money can be free. Yeah, definitely. So, the, uh, I mean, we're going to kind of wrap this up in a little bit, but I kind of want to know how your portfolio, like, as far as what is the makeup of it? Is it just single families or is it multi families or what is it? How does it look? Multi families. Uh, I just got what did you say that again? Only yeah. three of them are multi families. Oh, okay. I just picked up a seven unit for $2,000. Uh, another one is oh. a triplex and one of them is a duplex. Yeah. Ah. How are you picking up? Where are you buying these? Are you buying them? <laughs> you no, know, that specific one came from an auction. But I didn't even have to go to the auction. Somebody won't. Is anyone auction. else even at these auctions? How are you getting these? <laughs> <laughs> 3000 like, what? 2000 Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 uh, I want to say it's not hundreds. Maybe like 150 at a time. They have them every month, too. But that was something that, that Rosebud's created. So my grandma's name was Rose. Rosebud's investments is that. Um. And what started to happen was people would talk to me like, yeah, I want to do this and that. And I was like, yeah, all right, well, how about you just try this? And I remember my first client, I just helped them for free general advice. And two weeks later, they made like $70,000. And I was like, and they're like, oh my God, thank you. And I was like, you're welcome. I did it again for somebody else. They made like $200,000. they like, oh my God, thank you. What do you want? I'm going to buy you a gift. I was like, oh, 10%. What do you mean? I want a gift. Just joking. I just was like, I was just like, congratulations, you're welcome. <laughs> I realized that I was actually really good at what I was doing. Like I knew what I was talking about and I knew what I was talking about to the point where I could like healthily, like I could advise you properly. Not just me saying anything. I was like, no. So not only is it working for me, I'm now telling people what to do and it's actually working for them. That's what you call a business. A business is just yep. where there's a need for something and then create. And as I was like, oh, maybe I should get an LLC. My my actual uh, mentor was like, you should get an LLC. I was like, mm -hmm. okay. like get an LLC. You, you um, what do you say? Open a bank account, then you'll be a business, then you'll get credit. Cause I ain't had no credit. So he told me to go, this is 
some bad advice he gave me. You go open secured credit cards. The more you put down, the higher your score will jump. So I had two five thousand dollar secured credit cards. Yeah. They didn't make unsecured. So I had ten thousand dollars tied up in secured cards. I was like, yo, give my money back. So they closed yeah. them. So they ended up hurting me more than it helped me. Yeah. Like I said, I take the good and bad from my mentors. I learned a lot from his mistakes. Like a lot of his mistakes made me successful because I was like, oh, he just stepped in poop. I'm definitely gonna work around that. Right. Um, so yeah, but that's how Rosebud got started. Cause like you said, people don't feel like they can start where they are. You can turn six hundred dollars into thousands without credit, without anything. Six hundred dollars is Chick Fil A. If you're me, Chick- I eat Chick Fil A a lot. Um, six hundred dollars is Chick Fil A over the course of a few weeks. So I just started taking people. Like I said, that auction thing set my bar. I was like six hundred. I know everybody was six hundred. I was telling everybody, it will come through. This is what we're gonna do. We're all gonna go here with six hundred dollars. Um, but there's so much inventory there. So while there are other people at auctions, first of all, they have them everywhere. Different cities and states because you have tax auctions and mortgage auctions. There are different types of auctions. But people negate to pay for whatever the reason all over the world. Um, and then the specific auctions that I favor, they're auctioning off about a thousand houses per month, you know, between the different auctions. So, yeah. But it's not one person that can buy everything. Right. Yeah. So what's for you? What's for you? We just go in there, you knock it out. And it's not every time I go in there and I'm getting. Seven units for two thousand dollars. Right. Sometimes I'm in there and there's a lot selling for three hundred thousand, and I'm like, this ain't my, this not my go around, you know. Facts. Yeah. Yep. And um, I apologize if I missed this earlier, but where are these properties located at? Philadelphia. Well, I have Philadelphia and I have Chester, and then I live okay. in the Pocono area, in which they're building a Disney World. So we coming through with a shovel, trying to get these <laughs> Airbnbs because I'm like, I can't wait till the market crash. It's taking so long. <laughs> Oh. Alex say that all the time, like, oh, when's it coming? <laughs> Come on. Yo, I put on my post notifications and everything. I can't wait until CNN goes up. Boom, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's coming okay. soon. So what are your plans moving forward then? Oh, um, don't stop, get it, get it. Like the song? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I just want to diversify my streams of income. Because mm-hmm. I kind of locked in with real estate. I got it. Like, I know what it is. I got it. I want to do syndications and get like 80 unit, like bigger things so I can pull certain people in because you do have people who have money and not time or have money and not knowledge. Like I have friends who are nurses and they do like a million doubles and I'm not knocking them, that's their career. But once they retire, they'll just be retired nurses. Yeah, you're right. What else you got? You create something for your Yeah, it's like, I used to be a nurse, I'm so good at it. So besides your social security and your pension, what else do you have to stand on like when it's time to retire? Can you go to Greece for a month and then go to Spain for another? Can you do that? Like, that's my goal. When I retire, I'm trying to do a month at a time. I, I love that mentality because a lot of times, you know, society just teaches us to, you know, only thing we should ever do is just, you know, go get a job. Because the thing about, you know, creating successful businesses, you, you're you selling, like you said earlier, you're selling something to someone, right? But so often, the only thing society ever teaches us to sell is our time. That's the only thing we're ever selling to people and most likely it's our job for the rest of our life so the fact that you know you want to create something and you're trying to get other people to do the same and get other people involved you know through syndication and also through your consulting business and also through you know all all these other streams of income that you're going to start generating that's you know really good because now these you're allowing other people to transfer wealth down to uh their kids and those other things you see that mindset too because i represent a lot being a woman being young being a mom like, I stand on so many different pedestals because some people use parenting as an excuse. I have to do this for my kids, but it's like, is that really for your kids or is that the excuse you make for yourself? Mm-hmm. Working a job to feed your family is honorable, but it's not smart at all, especially if you don't have to. Because now you're working three jobs to feed your kids, but do you have time to actually hug them? Do you have time to help them with their homework? I think those things are more important than you paying the bills that you got to pay anyway. Like, bills don't go away. You die and bill collectors still like, hi, is this the... Yeah, <laughs> I think money. So, cause I like you know, it's a it's another end of the story. So I just feel like you should really prioritize what it is. So sometimes I'll have an event and I'll take one of my kids. Yeah. Like I'm at a seminar. I had my daughter. Like this is what I'm a mom, with or without you guys here, and this is what it is. Like I work from home. You gotta just use your talents and your gifts. Like people sign up for jobs that they don't even like because it pays them. That's miserable. So are you happy? No. So are you being the best version of yourself? Now, I made a hundred thousand dollars in a row at home. On the phone, talking about my life. Yeah, it just so happens that the things I'm talking about helps people change their lives. But how many people have those types of gifts? I was home. 
I would never forget, they uh, called me to do career day at a uh, charter school. It wasn't high school, it was middle school. High school. No, it was middle school. And I was like, you know, came all dressed up, kids like stuff. So I wear like the shiny Gucci stuff that I don't even really buy. My husband wore those shoes. I would never spend that much on a pair of sneakers. But anyway, I walk in there and the kids are like eating it up. I'm like, yo, listen. Just be intentional about what you want to do. Like, I have principles I live by. Um, it's D-O-O-B, so discipline, ownership, opportunity, and branding. So, Rosebud Investments, I always wear this. You see the different colors, though. It doesn't have to look like a uniform. Make it fun. I can dress this up with any color. I have a million different color shirts. But anyway, I go in there. I'm telling them, like, ownership is key. But before you can own anything else, ownership of self comes first. So, that's kind of where I was at with them. I'm like, kid, yeah, you got to own yourself. So, don't go to school to be a dentist if you know you want to be a chef. Don't go to school. Like, I'm asking the kids, what do you want to be? One person wants to be a DJ. One person wants to be a producer. I'm like, y'all can be partners. At this point, put something together. One person wants to be a nurse. I'm like, look, y'all can do home healthy. Open a business. Get a build. I'm talking to them like that. Like, wow. There's people that's in the same school. Then I'm like, yeah, call each other after this. Y'all got the same goals in mind. And I'm like, this is what I did. It was like a three months or something. It was a three months. And I'm like, look, I made $40,000 in the last three months. Look, so I'm telling the kids because they want to see stuff. Kids like what they see. And one of the teachers behind me was like, no way. I was like, here, I passed on the phone. Cause you know, got everything on Square. I was using Square as a processing. And she was like, that's what I make a year. So the teachers, like the teacher left. I guess I went to talk to other teachers. They were like, after this, could you stay? Like they bought me lunch and I ended up having a teacher conference. So this is a career day turned into teacher. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, this is a thing. And just saying the atmosphere of the school, yeah, they was definitely underpaid. Um, <laughs> but I just say that to say so many people get caught up in that funnel just because it's safe. Mm-hmm. Here to take that chance and that risk for themselves, they would rather it be safe. But there's nothing safe about what you're doing because if you don't have enough to save or you don't have enough to invest, you're living as if you can work for the next 30 years. But if you die tomorrow, nothing was safe about what you did. It was in vain. Nobody has anything anyway. So now those three jobs you work to pay the bills, those bills are not getting paid. Your kid now has to go to foster care because you got paid. Literally, you got to just stop looking at life like you got forever in a day because you don't. If I die today, I'm going to die happy. I'm going to die culturally diverse. I eat different food. <laughs> no, this are serious. That's what life is about. You, you have to really do what makes sense. And if you yeah. have out, then make it work for you as well. Yeah, like, facts. All day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just paying my bills. Their bills are constant. They won't go away. Like they just won't go away. Take some money out of a paycheck or have a 401k. Do a self-directed IRA. Just really educate yourself on the possibility and set yourself up. Because if you stick or you fall down, they like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. People be renting for 50 years and paying their rent. Yeah. A lot of people say. <laughs> a lot of people say it's you know risky to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, it's risky to invest, but to be honest, I think it's more risky not to, right? Like sure. that, it's crazy to me to think that because I don't know, man. I just couldn't. I can't. You're just giving up your whole life in yeah, in return for safety, right? And the power of somebody else's hands. I think it's stupid. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think man, the most pe- people are afraid to lose, but they don't look at it like what they're doing every day is losing. People are afraid to lose. That's really what it is. But if yeah. you push strategically. Like it's a house. You stood the door right there, right in the windows, because they don't have feet and they don't look up. Well, if you can conceptualize numbers, as long as the numbers make sense on the deal, even if you lose, you're not gonna lose much. Yeah. It's going to appreciate. So you always can look at it like I'm gonna make my money back. If you rent it out, you always want to. The the risk comes in when you're leveraging, you over leveraging, you're just doing things wrong, or you get a bad tenant. But even with that, you can only suffer for so many months. A victim. You get what I'm saying? Now all things can be corrected. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Okay, so we kind of want to wrap this up with our like fast five. Um, that's kind of what we do with every guest. So this is pretty much a segment where we'll ask you five questions and then you answer them in sixty seconds or less. Well, um, the first one is, uh, what does success mean to you? Um, happiness, freedom, efficiency. Okay, it's short and sweet. Yes. All right. So second one, uh, what's your favorite money slash real estate bo- or business book? I guess. Oh my gosh. I, I wouldn't want to say the Bible. I really mean it. Because every day you got to leave just your life with some type of guidance. Even if you got really good mentors or stuff like that, they have lives and they have things to do as well. And sometimes you got to really just trust your instinct. So having good coverage. I just, every day I wake up, I got the, the Bible at my phone. 
And I'll get all into it reading 90 chapters a day. I'll read that one verse and I'll apply it to wherever I'm at in my life or just make it fit what I got going on. Like, all right, God, I heard what you said. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. Okay. So what's the best piece of advice you can give to people? Bet on yourself. <laughs> Everything, I'm dead serious. Everything that you need is already inside of you. It got you that far. And it takes a lot more to struggle than it does to be successful. Now, when you are successful, a certain responsibility is that you have to adhere to a certain thing that you have to do. But it's easier, right? When you're broke and you're trying to make ends meet, the amount of energy you have to put into survival, you got to use, like, at least half of it to actually be successful when you get things running. Mm -hmm. Correct that on yourself. Like, everything that got you to this point is what you need to get you to the next point. And then you'll just grab more as you go along to get you to the next point. Dropping jams. All right, question number four. If you can go back and change anything in your career so far, uh, what would it be? I don't know. I think it's a true question. I would say that I wouldn't sell my grandma house. But I think selling it was like one of the best things that I had to do. Um, I probably wouldn't sell both of them, though. I probably would have kept one of them instead of selling it. I can't even say I sold it because my great grandma sold it. They were all her profits. I didn't see them at all. But I feel like I could have advised her better because I wouldn't have told my clients now knowing what I know I wouldn't have told them to do what I told her to do so. right yeah. okay so where can people find out more about you uh rosebuds investments everywhere so the website is rosebudsinvestments.com um my instagram is at rosebuds investments facebook is rosebuds investments I don't tweet but I should I got a lot to say though I don't think I can do it I'm a funny character but just everything rosebuds investments um and what I offer is one-on-one -on -one hand holding for the new investor. So like literally wherever you are, I help you from wherever you are. It's personalized, so it's really good. Um, and we'll just figure out where you are and create a blueprint. And I help people with no cash, no credit. And I even give you 14,000 in unsecured credit if you need building. Um, if you're a person with no money, you talk about wholesaling or taking that $600 property, wholesaling that to make a few thousand. Like I can literally get you started from like the mud. I don't care where you are or who you are, I can help you. Cool. Sounds good. There you go. Yard. Okay. Well, this was great. Um. So yeah, definitely. Um. You know, if y'all you know enjoyed that, go listen to that again. Get us a thumbs up. Um. Check this out on YouTube or uh Apple Podcasts wherever you're listening. Um. Give us a you know thumbs up if y'all enjoyed that one. So, but yeah, uh, Jamisa, we definitely appreciate you coming and talking to us today and sharing us sharing your uh, expertise and your experiences with our listeners and also with us too. We learned a lot here today, so really appreciate that. Thank you guys for having me. It was fun. Facts, definitely. Yeah. That's it for this episode of the Money Monopolizers podcast. New episodes will be released every Thursday and will be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Just search Money Monopolizers wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you learned something of value today. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you rated us and left us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find out more info about us on Twitter at The Monopolizers or on IG at Money Monopolizers. We post informative content on there that'll keep you engaged. So check that out and share those posts. But until then, we out of here. And go check out the Whiteboard Wednesday. Just came out yesterday, too. So definitely go check that. For sure. You've been listening to The Money Monopolizers podcast helping you take control of your financial destiny. To learn more about how you can be in control of your money, visit moneymonopolizers.com. We'll catch you next time when Alex and Marlon share more personal finance and wealth creation tips with you. Now it's time to take action.